Hi, my name is Steve Neal, and you might remember me from my work on Star Trek, the motion picture, Next Generation, Star Trek VI, and many other films, and you are listening to Trek Untold. And welcome to Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I'm your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. If there's one thing I've learned in all my years of going to Comic Cons, it's that you never pass up a chance to speak with a special effects person. They always have the best stories, and they know all the behind the scenes gossip that you're not going to hear from anybody else. And more so, they are really the people who know how things got done on set, especially because usually they're part of that reason. This episode of Trek Untold is exactly the kind of conversation I would have had with today's guest if I saw him at a convention, but the only difference here is that I got to speak to him for over an hour, as opposed to the few minutes I would have spent with him while I had his table. And on the plus side too, you're here to eavesdrop on that conversation. Today we're speaking with Steve Neal, who's known for his work on Star Trek The Motion Picture and some other Star Trek films, along with the pilot episode for Star Trek The Next Generation Encounter at Farpoint. Beyond Star Trek, Steve's worked on Laser Blast, Ghostbusters, Fright Night, the Stuff, Return of Swamp Thing, Puppet Master, Battle Beyond the Stars, and many, many other projects, including one rather surprising one that has a pretty good Star Trek connection, but you're going to want to stick around to discover what that one is. These days, Steve is still involved in the biz and has grown and adapted as the times changed. But at the end of the day, his love for physical effects remains. He's constantly building or painting something, and his creativity remains just as strong as it did when he first set foot into the effects industry. But before we jump into today's interview, I want to ask you if you're following us yet on social media. If you're not, you can check out Trek Untold on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and we update there constantly. It's the best way to find out who this week's guest is going to be in advance, and also potentially ask them any questions when we offer that option. So that's Trek Untold, one word, no spaces, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. If you'd like to help support the show, you can check out teespring.com slash stores slash Trek Untold to take a look at some of the merchandise we have there, which includes t-shirts hoodies, mugs, stickers, and all sorts of other things. We'll be releasing new designs constantly, so make sure to keep an eye there if you'd like to support this show and show off to your friends how much you like it. You can also directly support this show by visiting patreon.com slash trekuntold to become a Patreon. But most important of all, please make sure to subscribe to this podcast, and if you're listening to it on iTunes, Spotify, Google, or any other audio forms, make sure to leave a review and a rating and drop some stars if you can. And if you're watching the YouTube version, Please don't forget to subscribe to Nerd News Today, the channel that you're watching this on, and give the video a thumbs up. And of course, while you're at it, feel free to comment there and let me know what you think of this week's guest. Subscribing, leaving ratings, leaving comments are all some of the most important things you can do to help this podcast continue to grow and ensure that more people find out about this show. And if you're already following us or supporting us on Patreon or have bought some merch, a big, big thank you for doing that or offering your support in whatever way that you can. Thank you for the help. There's a lot of Star Trek podcasts out there, and I'm very grateful that you've chosen to listen to this one today. I'd also like to make a quick shout out to our sponsor at Triple Fiction Productions, who makes some amazing 3D printed Star Trek inspired dioramas and props for both Star Trek action figures and Star Trek fans in person. Whether you're a cosplayer or a toy collector, there's plenty of stuff to check out from Triple Fiction Productions, but you're going to hear a little bit more about them later on. Now, without further ado, let's beam up today's guest. Computer? access interview file. Hello and welcome back to Trek Untold. And now joining us on the other side of the screen here, we've got a man who's done things from prosthetics to stop motions to props and everything in between. We're joined today by Mr. Steve Neal. Steve, how's it going today? Going great. Thanks for having me on the show. I've heard a lot about it. So Steve, let's just jump right in. And I want to give you the first question that I ask all of our guests. And that's, what's your earliest memory of Star Trek? Let's see. It was uh, 1968 or was it not? It was... 66, I believe. That's when it first aired, correct? And, and uh, over 50 years ago. Anyway, I digress. Uh, <laughs> I was in high school and I heard about Star Trek and I watched it because uh, I'm a space geek. I, you know, I watched uh, everything from Alan Shepard uh, giving his classic uh, uh, prayer at the very beginning of the space program all the way up to yesterday's Blue Origin. So Star Trek was a space show. It had a starship in it, crew on board. I saw them, you know, they had trailers for it, I think, and and uh, TV guy talked about it. And 
Um, and I, I had to watch it. So I watched it and I loved it. And, and of course, the first episode they ran was uh, the one with Gary Lockwood in it, who has since become a friend who I talk to all the time and has been to the studio. And it's just amazing circle of events. Uh, but that's how I started. And, and I got to where I couldn't miss it. If I was at my uh, girlfriend's house, who was about three, four, maybe even five miles away, well, they had a color TV set. I didn't, and, and they didn't like it. They thought it was hokey or it just didn't interest them. So I would run five miles nonstop to get home to watch it on, on television. So that's kind of how it started for me. Now, I know we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves because I usually like to structure the show pretty much, you know, very much chronologically, but uh, I do right. want to ask you, you were uh, actually at one of the very first Star Trek conventions that the Trimbles put on, right? Yeah, I was. I don't think it was the very first one, but it was about 1973. Uh, maybe it was, I don't know. But uh, that's how I met uh, Greg Jean, Bijo, John, and a whole bunch of other people, including Gene Roddenberry and Major Barrett, who were very, very approachable people. You could just go walk over and talk to them. And, you know, so we got to know each other over the years. And what was it like at one of those early Star Trek conventions? You know, I, when now we're in the COVID pandemic, so I'm not going to as many cons, yeah. obviously. Nobody is. Right. But, you know, for back then, 1970s, what does a Star Trek convention look and sound like? It was totally, it was completely different. It really was. I mean, first of all, they were held at a place uh, like the Marriott. And so we used their convention center and their rooms. Uh, back in those days, they were entirely fan run. Um, the uh, main object was not to make money. The main object was to get together with a bunch of like-minded people who had a passion for Star Trek and science fiction in general and get together and have a great weekend of fun. It was very family-like. The crowds were smaller, maybe only two, 3,000 people. I might be off on that. Sometimes they were a little larger, but they weren't real big. They had dealer rooms uh, that where you could get phasers and communicators that people were making and major ran around trying to make sure that they knew that they couldn't do it, but they could do it kind of thing. You know, um, everyone was very forgiving back then. We had uh, all these individual rooms where they would run Star Trek episodes. They would run uh, science fiction movies and horror films and stuff. And so late into the night, up till about 12 midnight or so, you could go after the convention closed and go to these rooms where they would be running a film projector and be running uh, Star Trek episodes. And it was a lot of fun because we, we'd all been to the bar and, and uh, had some food in our stomach. And we after a long day at the convention, we'd go in there and we'd watch the show and we all laughed and cheered our favorite moments. It was uh, a very, uh, I mean, you had a real feeling of connection. You made friends with a lot of people, a lot of those people were famous people who were very approachable and, and very friendly because they realized the value of their fans. So uh, then they had the costume contests, which were great. And you, everybody would you know, pick a costume to do and they'd knock themselves out, trying out to the other person. And then at night, they were held at night in the big auditorium. Uh, they would have uh, the contestants come up, do a little bet, and then give the prize to the best one. That's how I met Bob Burns, the famous Bob Burns. I was in my gorilla suit and he was in Tracy from Ghostbusters and I didn't know he was in the audience. And I walked out in my gorilla suit. The next thing I knew, this big gorilla jumped up on the stage and started grooming me. That was Bob Burns. <laughs> We've been friends ever since. That's awesome. It's great to hear that Star Trek cons have been connecting people even since day one. So that's really cool. Yeah. I sold, I sold Spock ears and uh, uh, Planet of the Apes prosthetics there because I've known at that time, I was early in my career. Uh, and of course, that's how that's how I really got to know Majel because she came over and she saw my sign said Spock ears and she said, you might want to call those just pointed ears. They're beautiful. That's all she said because she was Lincoln Enterprises back then and basically that was a copyright infringement. So she told me the way to get around it. And people would line up to buy these and then I would ask some of the people would pay me extra money to apply them. So we're going to come back to those Vulcan ears in a little bit, but first things first, <laughs> let's go ahead. Uh, let's let's create a little temporal anomaly here. Let's go back in time and talk about Steve Neal's origins. Where did you grow up? <laughs> Who were your parents? And what did little Steve want to be when he grew up? Well, I grew up in San Francisco. 
My mom was a, a talented uh, artist in her own right, but she did not pursue that career. She, she went into just in business. Uh, my dad was also an extremely talented uh, commercial artist, but he also was an engineer. So he worked on nuclear submarines at Mare at Island, and he did uh, contracts for advertising agencies uh, with his artwork. And he was a model builder too, and he loved slot cars like I do. And he had a real interest in, in uh, modeling slot cars, art, all that kind of stuff. So, and in fact, my whole family was artists and uh, uh, musicians and uh, painters and sculptors. So I grew up in that environment. Um, and then uh, later on, uh, after living in the Bay Area till I grew up, I then you know came to uh, Pacifica, California. Uh, my mom moved us down there, um, and that's when I first started Star Trek, and uh, that led to a real interest in recreating things from Star Trek and making aliens and making smock ears and that kind of stuff. And once I got out of high school. Um, Aside from my filmmaking interest, which I also pursued, uh, I ended up at the American Zotro right out of high school and met Francis Coppola and entered at that studio. So that's the short story, the real quick story. Yeah, can you, can you tell us a little bit more about Francis Ford Coppola? Because that's pretty crazy, you know, for a first internship in the industry, you're now side by side with Francis Coppola, who had become quite a big name uh, and was already a big yeah. name at that point. Yeah, he was, and mostly because of Pat of that screenplay. Uh, he hadn't done um, the Godfather series yet, but he was starting. And so Mario Puzo was there all the time and uh, I got to have Chinese food with him every day. And it was an amazing thing. But uh, what happened is I discovered Star Trek, of course, and I love Star Trek. And then I discovered Stanley Kubrick in 2001. And that completely blew my mind. So any, any thoughts I had about becoming an astronaut or going into astrophysics or becoming a pilot went right out the airlock, so to speak. And I, I wanted to pursue filmmaking. I became obsessed with Kubrick filmmaking and started making my own films. After I got out of high school, I saw an article in the San Francisco Chronicle that uh, about the American Zotro. And George Lucas was just in production with THX 1138, which I love that film. And uh, there was an article and it, and it said that, that Coppola and him and John Cordy they wanted to help young filmmakers. Your young filmmaker contact. So I literally did. I picked up the phone. I called them. They invited me down. I uh, showed my films to Francis Lucas, if you can imagine that, um, my eight millimeter and my 60 millimeter movies on his pull down screen in his office. Uh, you have to realize that I knew more about George Lucas than, than I did about Coppola because Lucas had done THX 1138 4EB which was his thesis film for graduation from college. And they ran that on PBS. And I saw that film uh, and it just fascinated me. And I, so I learned a lot about Lucas. Um, so in then Francis later, as time went on, I realized you know, that he was a pretty big shot kind of guy, but he was a really wonderful human being. He was very kind to me, very helpful. Uh, he would uh, give me a ride home sometimes. I had an Alfa Romeo sports car, which broke down a lot. And uh, so he would drive me to the bus station or take me home in Cadillac, El Dorado. I went to parties with him, Grateful Dead concerts. Uh, I, I really got included in, in the Zotro family. And I was always invited to these parties and, and events in Mill Valley in, in the Bay Area. So uh, he, he was really helpful for me in my education of filmmaking. Um, I got to meet Arthur C. Clarke there and Sidney Portier. So I got to meet a lot of amazing people through him as a result. So I've always been very grateful to Francis. Now, we're talking here in the 1970s and learning about things like makeup, prosthetics, special effects makeup. Uh, it's not something that's really, you know, at that point, widely taught, widely instructed in places. So for yourself, where do you go to learn more about that subject? Well, today, the internet. But back then... I had nothing. I saw the Planet of the Apes. I mean, that was a, a really whirlwind period of three years there between Star Trek, uh, 2001, Planet of the Apes, later Silent Running, and uh, Omega Man. And just, there were just these amazing science fiction films being made. But I really think that Star Trek, uh, 2001, and Planet of the Apes, first movie, were really, really, really... Uh, 
a huge influence on me and a lot of other people. I wanted to know, A, how did they do Mean White Beards? B, how did they do the apes in, in, in the film? Uh, I knew it was made up. I was very interested in monster makeup because I've always been a fan of Hammer films, and Universal films. I read Famous Monsters. I read about Dick Smith. But I really couldn't get a lot of information. I got some. I knew how they were making them, but I didn't know in particular how they were making the Planet of the Apes uh, uh, makeups. Uh, they had a, a making of on Planet of the Apes which they ran on television, but in those days you couldn't record it. So anytime it was going to come on, I had to watch it. Um, and I remember snapping Polaroids off the screen just so I could have a long look at the molds they showed where they were pulling the rubber on. And from that and some uh, correspondence and buying materials uh, through the mail, like foam rubber and, and, and writing to certain people. And a person I met in college who was doing sculpting on life masks, he showed me how to make a life mask and he would sculpt like it appliance on it, make it out of latex, not foam rubber, but that was the gateway. So between all of those things, I sort of back engineered what they did. And I think it was about 1971, I did my first Planet of the Apes makeup on myself, uh, and it was a huge hit. Next thing I knew, people uh, all around town from San Francisco wanted me to make them up for Halloween and this kind of thing. Uh, I started doing other masks, and it just kind of went from there, and that's how I learned. I learned uh, the hard way. Of course, today you can go on uh, the internet. Uh, there's a number of sources and schools you can go to and, and things on YouTube and Vimeo that will show you the basic processes to get you started. I wish we would have had that back then when we didn't. But in a way, it was much more of an adventure. <laughs> That's true. And I also had read that you had some, uh, some time being mentored by the legendary Rick Baker. Can you tell us how you two crossed paths? Uh, yeah, well, um, when I first came to LA, I had this little tiny uh, studio apartment on Doheny. And, and, and it was at Doheny in Santa Monica, which was, you know, I got to see things like when I'd walk up to the store, I'd see Mo Howard walk into the store and, to get, and talk to him. I mean, uh, Darren McGavin, I ran into all kinds of people because when I moved there, the rent was fairly reasonable. And at, at this one place I found, but I didn't realize where I really was. It was like in the hotbed of all these people that work within the industry. So that was, that was pretty amazing. So I'm in that apartment and I decided, I knew about Schlock and some of the other things Rick had done. And, and I thought his work was really cool because it was in the magazine and uh, famous monsters and stuff. So I went through the phone book. I knew he lived in North Hollywood. So I looked at the, the Rick Bakers that were there and there were a few of them. So I just called each one of them and I did the same thing that everybody did to Rick in those days. This Rick Baker, this the Rick Baker that does make effects. And they say, no, you have the wrong number to hang up. But finally, I did get Rick. And uh, you know, you could tell when I asked him the questions, he, he was, yes, it is, uh-huh. Okay, so you get this a lot. Well, I'm Steve Neal and I'm down from Sam School Bay Area, and I do uh, makeup and effects and stuff, and I wanted to meet you. So he invited me right over. So I went over and showed him my work. And we just became friends after that. And then later on, uh, when he started getting bigger jobs, uh, he started referring me to some of his B director clients, like Larry Cohen, over to me uh, to, to, to do work for them that he couldn't do anymore. And that was really a, a big gateway to my career. In fact, I stayed in touch with Larry Cohen right up till he passed away. Uh, we were working on a project together, so uh, we never lost touch. Now, was Larry Cohen one of the first people you worked for professionally, or, or who was your first professional gig actually with? Well, um, the first professional gig was on Planet of the Apes TV series for a few days. Uh, I had made contact with the union. They put me on a, a, a list. I joined the union. They put me on a list. Uh, that when they ran out of a certain amount of uh, makeup people that they could call on this list. And every day that you worked went towards your day, which is like 120 days you had to get on show or several shows. And then you could take the test and then become group one. Uh, so I got to go there and that was, uh, you know, I remember it like yesterday. I may not remember the question you just asked me, but I will never forget walking into what's called the long trailer. And I don't know if you've heard about the long trailer. No, I don't think I've heard of the long trailer before. Okay, the long trailer is a long trailer that they built. Pretty self-explanatory, I guess. Yeah, and it had like 20 or so barber chairs in it. 
they had built that for Planet of the Apes because when they did the first movie and the other films, they had so many makeup artists and so many actors actually going in the makeup, not just wearing the background masks, that they needed a very large trailer so they could make these actors up because it took four hours for each one, as you probably know by now, and that takes quite a while. Um, so I walk in there because that's where I'm supposed to report because we're supposed to put a prosthetic on somebody. And I walked in and um, there were all these people. I didn't recognize any of them except for John Chambers, who I knew from television and from when he was on What's My Line and uh, and uh, our Academy Awards and when his Academy Awards from the age of because he was a god, you know, and he, he's a guy who created one of the apes makeup. And then Rodney McDowell came in in a white bathrobe saying hello to everybody. That was the first time I ever met and worked with Roddy. And, you know, we got to know each other pretty well over the years because we kept working on films together. But that was my first time seeing him. Uh, it was just an amazing moment because, you know, I was 25 or thereabout, you know, I was a young guy. and and these people were gods to me, and, and people were, were amazed me. And there I was in their midst, and I was even going to work with them. And, and I still feel that feeling back then. And it, it was incredible. It was really incredible. And so that was my first professional job. And now I read you also did a lot of work on some Roger Corman films, and I always like hearing stories about Roger Corman. Uh, do you remember anything about working with him? Yeah, I like Roger. He was very calm, smart. Uh, he was cautious, he, um, he knew what he wanted, and he expects you, even if you disagree with his artistic choices, to agree with him because he was painting the bill. So I learned early on not to be an eccentric artist. And, oh God, if you do that to my design, I just can't live. And No, you took the money, you did what they asked, you made them happy, and guess what? I got to do a whole bunch more movies for, uh, for Roger, but Roger was, was very kind and I really enjoyed working with him as I I knew right where I stood because he shot from his hip and I do remember uh instances that were a little disconcerting like uh, there was this film we worked on where we had to build a series of, of alien creatures there's actually one that evolved into a big giant creature at the end and um I can't remember the name of the film Right now, right this second, the minute I get off this, I will remember the film because I did several for him. I, you know, Battle Beyond the Stars was the first one, and that was a big deal. But in this particular movie, uh, I think it was, it was called. God, I can't remember. It's escaping me. It was about this big alien, and it was kind of based on the Giger alien, but it was much, much larger. Bob and Denny Sakotak, and uh, also uh, uh, Jim was working on that. And uh, I got to know him really well. Uh, and he wanted us to build this big full-size practical puppet. And I said, well, Roger, we can build parts of it and then do the rest of stop motion animation. And I'll never forget it. And he leaned over to me and he said, now, Steve, we all know that stop motion animation doesn't look real. So we won't be doing stop motion animation <laughs> because I was going to recommend Randy Cook and Dave Allen to do it because I was friends with them at the time. So, uh, and, you know, Bob Skotek kind of looked at me, you know, looked away and, and Jim looked away and Dave looked away because <laughs> evidently they had been through this before. So, but fine. So we built a big giant rubber creature and we had a lot of fun with it and uh, it was called Mutant. I told you. <laughs> I remember it. it was called Mutant, and it's actually a pretty popular cult film to this day. So we did a lot of blood and guts and makeup. John Buke, bless his, bless his heart, worked on that as well. He left us and went west uh, last year or the year before. So, um, so I had a very good experience working with him, and uh, that's how I met Gail Ann Hurd, and, uh, and we're still in touch. Uh, I met a lot of people that a lot of exposure. Basically, we give you carte blanche, you can kill yourself on it, you know, knocking yourself out. And we did. We worked exhausting hours. We worked way beyond the call of duty because we were all young guys, and this was our chance to really prove ourselves and do some really cool stuff. And you give us the money we needed to do it. Maybe not so much the paycheck. It was all right, <laughs> but you wanted material, you got it. So, 
he was good. I'm very grateful to Rod. Steve, you've worked on a lot of movies through your career, and unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss all of them today because that would be a whole other show. But uh, the one I want to discuss right now before we go into Trek is one of my favorites of all time, and that's Ghostbusters. You were involved in Ghostbusters uh, in the visual effects department. So can you tell us a little bit about what you did on Ghostbusters? Well, sure, but I'm disappointed it wasn't laser blast because that's the one I get asked about the most. <laughs> I, I know. I've seen some interviews where you talk about laser blast, and I'm like, everybody's been there, done that. Let's talk about Ghostbusters. Yeah, okay. Ghostbusters. Well, you know, I got a phone call one day uh, from Boss Films, from uh, from Howard and, he, and uh, I mean, Stuart, Stuart Zip. Uh, and he um, asked me if, if, if I could come down and interview that I'd been highly recommended and wanted you to work on the team with uh, Steve Johnson or Andy Cook and the other people. I said, okay, fine. So I went down and interviewed and all that stuff. Some days went by. I kind of forgot about it. And I get a phone call. Actually, I got a, a it was phone machine day. I played back the messages. And uh, it was Stuart, and he said, I've got some good news for you, and I've got some bad news for you. Please give me a call. And I think, oh, geez, what went wrong? And he said, the good news is uh, you got the job. The bad news is you got to start tomorrow. <laughs> and that's how, it, that's how it went. I mean, he literally, uh, I had to be there at 7 a.m. down in Marina Del Rey at Boss Films. And I reported for duty. The first thing they gave me to do was uh, the jail ghost sequence. Uh, they, they originally was going to be a jail ghost scene where they look inside the, where they put the ghosts and you can see some of the various ghosts in there. And I was going to make these puppets. And I only made sculpted one. I actually have one picture of it still uh, that I recently shared with the Ghostbusters community. They had never seen it before. And they're always looking for new stuff. So I worked on Ghostbusters. I did the, uh, the big chair scene with Sigourney Weaver, and uh, I'm the one grabbing her in the face. Two friends of mine are puppeteering the other hands. I built the hands. I worked with the, uh, the, the prop builder on the chair. There were three different chairs. One of them I'm actually inside the arm of, and they had breakaway arms, and you, you do it over and over again. Uh, the other one was open so that we could be on the outside, and they pulled in tight as she's rolling along. Um, and uh, we had another chair that was a static chair that had the arms sticking up and they were already on her and already coming out. And those were dummy ones. And, and so you could see this uh, wide shot, the turn around, that kind of thing. It took like four days to shoot that sequence. Uh, one of the things that happened during the sequence, uh, and I'll keep it short, is I, I kept kept doing the scene and, and, and uh, Ivan kept saying, you know, um, it's just not working for me. Uh, what's going on? And uh, Sigourney looked down at me through the, through the arm of the chair and she said, Steve, I can't act being hit in the face by your hand and grab as well as if you really do it. I want you to do it for real. I want you to hit me with everything you've got because that's, he says, that's what it is. I said, well, these nails are acrylic and they're, they're, they're kind of, I could poke an eye out or scratch or black and blue in the face. And she said, I don't care. I'd rather the scene look right. I'd rather have it work right. And uh, Ivan looks at me and goes, go ahead, Steve. She likes it. He's making jokes, you know, like she liked being beat up. So I said, okay. And so, yeah, I did hit her full. When you see her head go like that, I hit her full on as strong as I could. And I did make her black and blue. Uh, we did it a couple more times. They just put makeup, you know, the next day on her. So. <laughs> It's, it's okay, it's okay, you know. So that was that was pretty amazing. And of course, I was in the terror dog suit a few times. Uh, when the terror dog's breaking out of the statue, uh, you see the hands moving and, and, and breaking away. That was my work there. Uh, I did mechanics for the uh, Stay Plus Marshmallow Man. And I did a bunch of other stuff on the show in, in, in the background, you know, different stuff helping out in different departments. Uh, but what I really wanted to work on was 2010 and he wouldn't let me go because it was being done in the same, you know, the same building. I'm watching Go to Discovery. I wouldn't be doing that. How often did you try and sneak off set to see what was going on in 2010? Oh, every second. I, I, every chance I got it, I'd walk away. I'd take a sculpting break, get some tea, walk over there, go in the mall shop, talk with you guys. Eventually, because of Adam Savage, and I will just kind of move this over here. I think you could see it. It led to that. Uh, I can more or less see it, but for folks who uh, for folks who are listening to the audio version, can you describe what that is? 
it's the space station from 2001, a space odyssey, and it's a very large model I built of it. Uh, it was done for a museum in San Francisco for an exhibit. And now of course my camera will go back, right? And then they returned it after the exhibit, so I still own it. And that was something that came to my friendship with Adam Savage. So it's, uh, I don't have this discovery that big. I wish I did, I got a smaller one up here, but yeah, I went over there all the time and hung out and I learned a lot about modeling there, which led to my model making uh, ambitions later on. Trek Untold will return momentarily. Trek Untold is brought to you by Triple Fiction Productions. If you're a Star Trek cosplayer looking for props or a toy collector looking to spice up your shelves, Triple Fiction Productions has you covered. Triple Fiction Productions produces affordable and unique 3D printed Trek inspired products from the original series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, and the movies. You can expect the same amount of care and attention to detail in any of the items in their catalog, whether it's a prop replica for use in a fan film or a part of a cosplay or accessories and playsets for figures from Playmates, Migos, or Diamond Select. Own your very own tricorder or phaser rifle with working lights, the bridge of the Enterprise E for your Playmates figures, or any other item from countless species and ships from the Star Trek universe. All products are 3D printed in the USA and are constantly evolving and improving based on fan feedback. To learn more about their products, visit them at triple-fictionproductions.net or on Facebook at facebook.com slash triple fiction productions. Triple Fiction Productions, taking Star Trek where no 3D printer has gone before. Hello everyone, I'm Armin Shimmelman. Perhaps you know me better as Quark from Deep Space Nine. As your favorite Ferengi, I'm here to promote a sale. It's not self-sealing stem bolts, but my new novel, Illyria. And the first book is called The Betrayal of Angels. Some of you may not know that aside from being an actor, I'm also a novelist. My newest novel is a mystery set in 1583. Its heroes are the historical characters of John Dee, who was a spiritualist, a book collector, and a spy. With him is an unsuccessful playwright named William Shakespeare. Their mission is to investigate a nobleman who happens to be Count Orsino from Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. The book employs comedy, history, and fantasy to tell a page turner of a story. The adventure is a trilogy, and the first book goes on sale November 5th, which happens to be my birthday. It reads a lot like Sherlock Holmes, or like one of my favorite shows, Homeland. Please check out my website at www.armandshimmerman, get the name right, .com, or you can get it directly from my publisher at www.jumpmasterpress.com. You can buy it either as a paperback, a hardback, or an ebook. So why don't you check it out and judge for yourself? Or better yet, give it as a gift to someone. I know they'll appreciate it. Uh, disclaimer, no Latin I'm accepted. We now return to Trek Untold. All right, so Steve, let's beam up into our Star Trek discussion now. And your first time working in the Star Trek franchise was in 1979 for the original motion picture. So tell yeah. us uh, how you ended up working on the Star Trek movie. That must have been, again, a huge, huge thing for you. Well, yeah, there's a, there's, there's a whole big, long story to it, but I'll keep it short. I, I, I knew uh, Bob Shepard. He was the head of makeup for Disney. Very big name in makeup. And he was this nice gentleman, older gentleman. Uh, and I don't remember exactly how I met him, but I did. And I ended up going over there and uh, doing a little bit of apprentice work with him and stuff and helping him with life masks and things like that. Then one day I got called from him because there was a, a TV show about talking shaggy dog. It was a morning kids show that he got asked to do. Well, he couldn't do it because he was under contract with Disney. And of course, the shaggy dog was their proprietary. And so they wouldn't allow him to do it. So he called me up and he said, do you want to do it? And that was pretty exciting. You know, I was going to get to do a prosthetic mate. And, and he basically showed me and helped me do it the way he did for the movies. And so I replicated all that. But I was not group one in the union. So we needed a makeup artist to, uh, to do it that was in the union. It was a known makeup artist. So he told me about Fred Phillips. I said, my God, Fred Phillips, you know, he's the man, right, from Star Trek. 
Howard Olivens. So I met Fred and uh, I, I got him the gig of applying my appliances on set. That started a friendship. And later on, that led to him calling me one day and saying, hey, Steve, you want to work in Star Trek? Now, I thought he was joking. This was 1978. As far as I knew, Star Trek was long gone and the new series they were trying to do was never going to happen. So I thought he was pulling a joke on me because he knew I, he knew I loved Star Trek. So no, I'm serious. Uh, I need your help down here. I can't see as well as I used to, and uh, I need someone to recreate Leonard's ears. So if you could imagine, I was screaming after I put down the phone, and you imagine correctly, I was absolutely. And so was V, because V, V, Neil, and I were were, were uh, together back then, and uh, she was like, she just thought that was the greatest thing in the world. Well, of course, who wouldn't? <laughs> you know, so. To this day, I remember going down Gower and parking in the Gower parking lot across the street from the side entrance, Paramount, going in there, being a little nervous, and the guard saying, yeah, yeah, okay, go in. Say a lot of Fred for me. Okay. So I went in there, I went to the famous stage and the famous makeup room, and there I was. And it was just amazing. And Fred was this wonderfully warm and just loving human being. I just, everybody loved Fred. Everybody loved Fred. Uh, he didn't talk to me long. He said, well, I have a seat. Uh, and I want you to sculpt over here on this table. And I said, okay. So I'm sitting there and I'm looking at the table and he puts down these ears. He used some of Leonard's ears that weren't used from, from the original TV series. You think you can make these look exactly the same. They gotta be exactly the same. And of course, you know what happened to that philosophy later on in Star Trek. <laughs> So I made them exactly the same. And uh, I studied those sculptures uh, that John Chambers had done uh, in great detail and I replicated them and I made the molds. Um, and that was the first thing I did for it. Now, later on, uh, I had some meetings with uh, Gene Roddenberry and Robert Wise. You wanna talk about a ner nervous moment for a young guy going into an office. Fred said, hey, Gene and uh, Robert wanna talk to you. You got a meeting with them. Yeah, yeah, I set it up for you. So I go over there and I go into the office. And here's two, these two gentlemen, distinguished gentlemen, sitting behind a desk. Come on in, don't be shy, all this stuff. And Gene was always like, oh, sit down, you know. And they wanted me to create an alien for the bridge. So I didn't, I didn't pass out. I managed to keep my wits about myself. And, uh, and I created the, the, I think they call it the geek. It was the, the large four-headed, Guy yeah, those are the, uh, the Randorites. Yeah, it was done in Billy's aunt. Billy's aunt and uh, Steve Lance was the other one. Yeah. So B applied the makeups because later on, uh, again, I had that issue uh, where I wasn't group one and V got in on the 90 Day Wonder program. Uh, she'd worked on the film with me and she applied to the 90 Day Wonder and got in. It was miraculous, but I wasn't. So perfect. I'll make prosthetic. V will put them on the show. Uh, and that's how that happened. So then V came in. Uh, I helped with everything on the show uh, that was being done with uh, with aliens and Spock ears and that stuff, and and that was that was just still to this day one of my fondest memories uh, in my career. I'll never forget being in that makeup room every day, and there Shatner sitting in a, a chair like this in full uniform, and then Nimoy sitting over here on one of the makeup tables, swinging his kicking his legs back and forth while smoking a cigarette fully dressed as Spock and flapping at Chapter. Oh, look at those shoes. It was amazing. And, and, and then there over here is Jimmy Doohan and Georgia Kai uh, and, and, and DeForest. And you just, you, you can't imagine for someone who loves something like Star Trek, what an amazing feeling it is to be in the midst of those people for the first time. When, when you were in high school, you would get the, the making of Star Trek and look through it and think, wow, wouldn't it be cool to be there and be on those sets? And then there you were actually there. Uh, I was one of the most unfortunate human beings on earth to have had that experience and be able to do that. Of course, years later, I worked on other Star Trek movies, but that's always my first, my first love with, with, with that moment and how nice Gene was to me because he already knew me from the convention. It, it was incredible. Now, you also had met Leonard Nimoy while you were working on those years, correct? Yes, yeah, oh yeah, I guess you heard the story, yeah. Well, 
you know, it was uh, late in the afternoon and I was working on the ear sculpting and uh, a shadow came over me in a deep voice, are those my ears? And I looked up and there he was. And it was just, uh, I said, yes, sir, that, those are your ears. Very nice, very nice. And then he went off to see Fred somewhere. And that was my first meeting with, with Leonard, so. Now let's get a little bit technical on this show here today because uh, I know you actually have some of those ears with you, but can you show us uh, the ears and describe a little bit of what the process was like back then to how you actually made prosthetic ears? Well, Fred had already made, a, uh, he had already made the ear casters. He had those, but I had to mount them in a back plate. But the back plate is the, is the, is the uh, round base that the ear is mounted into. We get rid of everything on the ear. We don't need to have uh, the casting, so we don't have any uh, lockups or undercuts. Um, and we sculpt the ear and then we lay clamp around it. Uh, I do have pictures that I'll share with you later that show the process. Um, and then because we didn't have silicones like we have today, the molds had to be made out of, well, what the audience will recognize as plaster, but it really is a very hard tool stone. And uh, this is one of the uh, molds one of the duplicate molds from the show. We had many molds we would use because they'd wear out. So uh, the ear casting uh, and the back plate would fit down in here and key in these little round keys. But in order to get the ear out of the mold, when we ran them out of foam rubber, it had to be come apart like this. So we had this part that fit behind the ear and then in front of the ear. And that's why when you look at the movies and especially the TV show, you can see that seam running down the ear because that was in, in the seam would be in the foam rubber and they would do their best back then to try to get rid of it, burn it, and then stipple more rubber over it. But we had to have a three piece mold. Now we just have a two piece mold. The whole thing is just silicone and the ear fits into it and just pulls out so you have no seam. But we did not have that ability back then. And uh, here's the other half, the other mold here. You can see the date on the other one's 1978, because that's when we actually did them. So then, then we made masters off of this and made many, many duplicate molds uh, so we could run a lot of foam every day. And by the end, I mean, Fred had this big bag of ears, you know, <laughs> and that you just use them every day. V kept the set and, and sold them not too long ago. It's amazing that they were still in good condition, but she had kept them sealed. So, and then of course, here, since I have the molds, uh, these are casting out of them, and that's uh, uh, I've been I've been offering these to the fans uh, in a shadow box. It's bigger than this, and it has a picture of Nimoy behind. But these are my personal ones, uh, cast from the original molds, and then of course uh, the chevron is an original one from one of the uniforms. I had several that I had kept, and they mysteriously disappeared, but I managed to hold on to that one. So. Um, so these are all original. So I still have these to, to this day. So Steve, being this giant Star Trek fan, you mentioned just how crazy it was being on set and seeing Shatner, seeing Nimoy on the set together. Yeah. Um, but again, this is the motion picture. Things are a little bit different from what we saw when the show was first out. They have different uniforms. The bridge is different. Sure. A lot of things have changed. Uh, so you know, you yeah. as a hardcore fan, what did you think when you saw all this new, all these new elements for this new version of Trek? I loved it. I, I you know, because it's it's supposedly we have uh, uh, it's been some time since the original series and the original ship and everything. It was I thought the refit was wonderful. It's just a beautiful, beautiful ship. And Andy, who uh, Probert, of course, is a good friend of mine, and we talk all the time. I think he did an incredible job on that. Uh, I like the uniforms. Um, I like the tech. Um, I, I didn't think it was too far stretched from the original show uh, that it, it that it worked of course Douglas Trumbull being chosen to do uh, the effects and originally uh, Robert Abel who I've also worked for we know what happened with Robert Abel on that show at least we know some of it we don't know what the real story is but uh, when uh, Trumbull took over you know it, those those effects still hold up just like all those effects always hold up um, so I was real pleased with it. Yeah, I really liked everything, except that halfway through the show, they brought in another makeup artist, and he decided he wanted to have his take on the ears, and he, uh, Minter Nimoy's ears, because I was working on something else, and he was depending to the ears suddenly, and all of a sudden, we had these little stubby fat ears. Uh, 
Um, and in fact, at the end of the film, uh, Leonard turns his head this way and he's got one of my big ears on as in the original show and he turns this way and he's got the shorter one on this side and it just, you know, I remember there was a, I had a conversation with him and I said, uh, Charlie, uh, you're doing that ear wrong. He says, how am I doing it wrong? It's a pointed ear. I said, it doesn't look exactly like the ones that, that uh, Chambers did. Oh, I'll have to wait. Yeah, pointed ear is a pointed ear. No one's going to notice the difference. I said, you're in the big leagues here. And you're going you're gonna to regret this because the fans are going to know. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's in here. And that was his attitude because he didn't care about Star Trek. And it took the job. For him. And there were a lot of people working on it. That's all. But other than that, I loved it. And I still like it. So outside of the motion picture, you then went on to work on Star Trek VI, as well as the pilot for Next Generation Encounter at Farpoint. Uh, so what can you tell us about your contributions on Star Trek VI and TNG? So I started by working for Richard Snell. He needed help on, on Star Trek VI, and we knew each other, and he had me come over, and he wanted me to do some sculpting there. And he wanted me to sculpt uh, Klingon headpieces. And I did quite a number of them. Uh, but I didn't get to work on set. And also, as I was cast as a Klingon, an extra Klingon, um, to be one of the people that went in on the bridge. And unfortunately, right at the very end, uh, I got bumped out because one of the producer's kids wanted to do it, which uh, was always disappointing. And then on top of that, we didn't get screen credit. Uh, but they did take out an ad in Variety with all the names in it. Um, same thing happened on Star Trek, uh, the motion picture. None of us got screen print. Uh, this happens a lot if you don't if you don't ask for it and put it in writing, which I have ever since done, or I don't work on the show. Um, so that was great. And then on uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation, um, I forget how I was co um, contacted, but uh, one of the producers uh, called me and invited me in. I met with him. I went down and he showed me all the sets and showed me all around. That was amazing. I mean, it was just amazing to see all the stuff they were doing. They wanted me to do tentacles, which are part of the creature. When they were inside, inside of it, which looked like caves, they came down and wrapped around them. And I designed this whole sequence where uh, we would shoot in reverse. And I was working with Jonathan Frakes, Marina Surtis, and uh, uh, LeVar Burton, uh, which you know, at that time, those people are all unknowns to me, you know, and I saw uh, Dana sitting over there with his full makeup, and Brent was very quiet, uh, uh, and so I was just with that group of people, and we were in the, in the set shooting those scenes, um, and so that was a lot of fun. I mean, uh, Jonathan was really, really nice. He was my favorite out of everybody I met there, and of course, Gene was his usual friendly self. I had to go to several meetings there, and talk about the tentacles and, and all that stuff. And uh, he said, here, I want you to have this path, the collision path. Said, this is carte blanche. Anytime you want to come down here and walk on the steps, you can get past all the security because you're one of the family, which and that was just amazing. He never forgot me from, from you know, those years prior. Um, so I was able to take my late wife on a tour of the Enterprise and all the sets. And I remember walking in on the bridge and they had it all lit up because they're getting close to, to shooting something. And there was this, this guy uh, bent down his knees, blowing on the, on the commission plaque and, and getting ready to mount it. Well, that was Mike Okuda, who I later became friends with, putting the commission plaque on. And uh, I remember walking through the sets and saying, these are nothing like the sets of, of years ago. These look like real consoles. There were no drips of glue. I mean, everything was pristine and beautiful. Uh, and there were ceilings in the corridors and ceilings in the sets. So you really felt like you were on board the Enterprise. That was a truly magnificent uh, bit of time I spent down there working on that. Unfortunately, the scene was cut uh, from the show because they felt it gave away too soon that, that the creature was alive. And, but I still got paid very well, and I, I got to uh, uh, be involved in a lot of things down there that I never would have been. Uh, after that, because uh, Doug Drex and I were, were close friends, Doug, during uh, all the productions, would invite me down to lunch and take me on tours of Deep Space Nine, Voyager, all the sets, let me go in on the on the runabout and sit in the command module of that. And, and so I really thank Doug a lot for always involving me, including me and Kuda and Sternbach in what was going on down there, because they, they knew I couldn't work on the shows, but they wanted to share their joy of being there with me. And that was very, very kind of them. 
So Steve, you've been in a lot of interesting projects that you've worked on that we sadly don't have time to discuss today, but that includes things like Fright Night, The Stuff, Laser Blast, as I mentioned a bunch of times in this interview here, and The Return of Swamp Thing, favorite cult hit of mine. Uh, but one of the things I do want to talk to you about today, which I think is like one of the wackiest, craziest things, is that you worked on a McDonald's commercial in the 1980s. You worked on Mac Tonight. So can you tell us a little bit about Mac Tonight? Uh, an advertising agency called me for McDonald's, very nice people, uh, and asked if I could do it. They had the design, but they needed they needed the, the sculpture and they needed to be able to have a way to make the face move. Uh, we also ended up puppeteering it. So my late wife, Julie, and the, myself and Bob Burns <laughs> were the puppeteers to make his face move, which turned out to be uh, a very lucrative thing because we got on-screen residuals for that. We all made a small fortune off of that character because we did it for a number of years. One of the most amazing things was prior to that, I had worked on a uh, Worlds of Wonder TV commercial about aliens coming down in the ship, coming into the woods and finding Pamela the talking doll. They had three actors, Laura Dash was one of them. I don't remember the third one, but the tall, thin one was Doug Jones. And I was so taken by him because I had him wrapped up in leather and in a full prosthetic mask with radio controlled eyes, moving stuff that he couldn't be taken out of. And he never complained and he was a consummate professional. So when they said, who do we, who can we get to, to do this, you know, Matt tonight character, we want some kind of thin and it's, you know, uh, it's almost like a dancer or something who can act in this mask and put up with all this. And I remembered him and I said, you got to get this guy. I know I work with him, Doug Jones. So they hired Doug Jones and uh, I made a life mask on him and we, I made the, the mask. Uh, and even um, my good friend, Todd Masters, who was very young at the time and came to me enthusiastically, asked for a job at my studio. You can imagine that. Yeah, of course, you know who Todd is, right? Todd Masters, the board queen. Yeah, uh, first contact, that that was all his work. And, and he's an incredible artist. So he was working on that too. And, uh, and we worked with Doug and we did those shows. And, and Bob Burns uh, worked on almost every single one of those doing puppeteering. So um, that, was a, that was a great character. I, I hate what's been done with it right recently. Um, the fact that the white supremacists picked it up and were using it, and that guy Moon Man, it, it, it brought me some discomfort because I had uh, people found out that I'm the one that did that and accusing me of being racist because you know how people are. They don't research anything. If they research, they find out it was a perfectly legitimate character uh, that we did and had nothing to do with racism, it never did. So. But that was a great experience, and um, you know, and I've been friends with uh, Doug ever since. And of course, now here he is, a famous Star Trek character. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of his work as well. And as you mentioned, yeah, he is Saru now in Star Trek Discovery. Uh, and I'm curious, you know, you've been in this industry for so long. What are your thoughts on the the look and the special effects of Star Trek Discovery? Well, I have to say that although I appreciate all the tech and how well done it is and attention to detail, it's very, very good work. But it was just, it's, it's, I understand it because look, you know, we live in an era now where most of our technology that we have is more sophisticated than things in next generation, you know, or the phones and everything else. And uh, so in order, in order to bridge a generation gap and make Star Trek palatable to younger people, uh, you can't give them the old communicator and expect them to, to appreciate it, or they'll say, gee, my cell phone is better than that thing. So uh, it was a little over tech for me. But the stuff I did appreciate were, of course, um, the characters, the acting, uh, the stories. For, for me, it was still very Trek, that, that part of it, you know? Um, yeah, I just, and of course, uh, I loved them bringing back uh, the characters from the original show as well. I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Captain, not Captain Abel. Uh, Captain Pike, uh, which one? Thank you, Captain Pike. I thought he was terrific. And when they when they really started getting into Pike and they brought back the old Enterprise, which I thought looked really cool, you know, it, it, much better than the thing that J.J. Abrams had. I mean, this looked like an acceptable upgrade to 
to the Enterprise, and they, they, they had a lot of Easter eggs inside of it, and even the uniforms and the yellow and the blue, and, the, and there were so many things that I could identify with from the old show. And yeah, it was more modern, but still it had that feeling, and the characters had that feeling. And the guy playing Spock looks nothing like him, and yet he convinced you he was him. And, and so I thought he did a really excellent job. They all did. The one, the girl playing number one, I mean, she's fantastic. And so I'm so glad that they're actually going to make that a series too, because when they jump to way far in the future, it's like, I'll still watch it because, you know, I try not to be judgmental. I try to give everything a chance. And then if I don't like it, I can say, well, I didn't like it that much. And it's fair. And that's my opinion. But if they're going to continue on with Pike, that that I'm all over that. That's going to be a lot of fun. But yeah, it was a little over tech for me, but I understand why they did it. So, but I did enjoy the show, and I do enjoy the show, and I love seeing my friend playing a main character like that because you know I'm always saying to him, "I knew you win." <laughs> I knew you back when you were Mac tonight. But he started as an alien. His first commercial, and he always forgets that in interviews. And I always run at him afterwards. I said, Doug, I heard the interview. And you're, you keep forgetting. You did Worlds of Wonder. He goes, oh, that's right. I forgot. His first job was being an alien. I'm hoping one day I get to speak to Doug. And I'm going to remind him of that. I'm going to say, Steve told me to tell you that. That's right. Uh, he is a truly wonderful, genuine human being. When you see him, and he's all full of life and balance and everything, that's him. It's not a put on. He's really that guy. And he's really got a sweet heart and uh he's always saying the world needs lots of love we always need love and that's true well, steve what is the weirdest thing you've ever created for a film that would have to have been for my first job with larry cohen and 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 he had me put something that looked like a vagina in the side of a person's uh belly in a movie called um god told me to that was the first film i did for him. i went on to do six seven pictures for larry and before he passed away, we were working on um, putting together a movie of the Invaders TV series. In fact, up to within two weeks of his passing away, we were talking weekly, uh, talking about people to pitch it to because he owned the movie rights to it. Um, he didn't want to bring back the old original saucer. I said, are you kidding me? You, that, you like that thing? I said, it was great. That saucer was so cool. You know, he said, well, it's so typical. I said, but it wasn't then and if you change that too much you're going to lose your original base audience you know so we had a lot of time a lot of fun talking about making the invaders tv series into a movie and, and so but that was the first job that was one rick baker gave me and 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 it was just weird you know the weird it had to open up and do all these things so uh, that was my weird, weirdest job everything else there's nothing weird about it it was just aliens and monsters uh, the laser blast gun, which is sitting back over here. I actually have one. Props, models, nothing was weird. I mean, it was weird to my friends and family because you're weird because you're into aliens and props and stuff and nothing will ever come of that for you. But I'm happy to say they were wrong. Very much so, yes. I was told that Hollywood will just fail. In fact, one of my family members says, well, don't you have to be really talented to succeed down there? And that was it. Next thing I knew, I was in my TR3 Triumph uh, sports car with, uh, I think, 700 bucks in my back pocket and uh, all my stuff in, in the trunk and my girlfriend. And we drove to LA and, and I said, you know, I'm going to succeed down there. And, you know, it's, it's like a classic, uh, it's classic tale you hear about all the time. I'm broke. I'm going to leave town and go to Hollywood to seek my fortune. But I actually did. And I succeeded. So I'm glad. <laughs> Would have been bad if I didn't. But I was, I was at the right place at the right time. There weren't that many of us, you know, and I got to know Rick right away. And then through him, I met all the other people uh, and was friends with him. I went to work for Tom Berman. I got to be friends with Tom, and I'm still friends with Tom to this day, and his son, Rob Berman. Uh, and I know Barney, too. And, you know, uh, that all came out of that. Jumping in that old beat-up sports car and driving to L.A. Now I have a nice sports car. <laughs> So one of the hobbies that you've had for, I'd say, most of your life, and that continues today, is model making. And we could see it. In fact, for folks watching the video version today, we could see a bunch behind you. Uh, there's also yeah. a bunch of masks, which I believe you created as well. Yeah, here, here's one of my just did, uh, because no one's ever made a definitive one. That is creepy. Yeah, it's, that's right. And that's uh, Baylock from the original series. Yeah, I'm a very big fan of um, 
Wa Chang, who did this, and a lot of other stuff for Outer Limits, and also the Salt Vampire. And for folks who are looking right now, they can actually see, in fact, uh, we've got the captain's chair for the original series behind us as well. Steve, did you make that captain's chair? Yeah, I did. It was all made off of uh, measurements taken off the original chair and off the original, uh, uh, not the burp chair, I forget the name of the other one, but um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's very studio accurate in every detail. And of course, Bruce Boyd, uh, who's, who's uh, infamous for making Star Trek props and, and, and things that are very accurate to the original series, he uh, sent me all the uh, all the small parts, the switches, the buttons, and things. They're all accurate. It's really really nice. And Gary Lockwood has sat in that chair. Doug Drexler, Michael Kuda, Rick Stern's back. Uh, did I say Gary Lockwood? Yeah, I did, didn't I? Yeah, Gary broke it, in fact. And uh, when I left the damage, and next time he's over, I'm gonna But Gary did this because after I'm long gone. That'll bring somebody some money. <laughs> I never had Dorothy Fontana or any of these people sign it. I never thought to do it. I could have Adam sign it in the back. I just never thought of that. In fact, when Adam Nimoy was here uh, during the um, documentary being made about his dad, and I was helping with that, I really helped him raise money for it. Uh, he came here and visited the studio and shot some footage here, which didn't make it in, but. Um, we took pictures of, of us with that and uh, also with the Enterprise. And that was really a big thrill. And he gave me, he later sent me a tunic. Uh, that's a, a Nova tunic that they had got because I wouldn't take any money from him. He wanted to pay me money because I gave him all these Spock ears and I put them in uh, the letterbox, shadow box. And we both of, he and I both signed them uh, to help raise money. And I didn't want, I didn't do it for the money. I don't need the money. I don't, you know, it's like, I, I want to just do this because I liked your dad. And, uh, and he was very kind to me. And I, and I came up somewhere, didn't you ever get an autograph from him? And I said, well, I, you don't ask for autographs when you're working on set. That's very unprofessional. Uh, at least that's what I thought. And so I never did. And I said, I did regret it because it would be nice to have a pair of signed ears, you know, after all this time. So he left for the day and the assistant came in and said, he wanted you to have this, and it was from Leonard's personal little archives. It was a, a, a picture of him and Leonard, uh, uh, Leonard and um, McCoy together, um, and it was signed by him, a real signature, not a stamp. And he gave me that, and then later, this Anova uh, or Nova. It's an, is it Anova? It's Anova. That makes the it's the, Anavo, the yeah, something like that. Closer yeah. to that. Very, very. I have ones I had made for me that are velour that are very accurate, but this was like really the real deal. And it was just so nice of you to send it to me, you know. So here's uh, the salt vampire. And this is also very accurate to the original. Um, and both of these have been big sellers with the uh, deep pocketed Star Trek collections, you know, because these are not not cheap these are you know these are a little under 300 bucks a piece and they're signed by me and they're accurate uh replicas of them because i worked very hard from photographs to get them to look like the real thing and i have more coming on the way uh andorians delosions everything but the board and they're really a lot of fun to do because for me this stuff has never gotten old every day when i wake up it's just as exciting if not more exciting than it was when i was a kid back in high school saying i want to do this stuff and that amt model was awful it's nothing like the enterprise i can see that those amt kits with the tricord and everything those things those are gonna fool anybody so i started making my own and of course eventually that led to the 66 inch you know uh enterprise that uh, doug drexler and kuda and gary kerr and the others contributed information to me to get right. So I was able to, to make this large model of the enterprise I've had ever since. Of course, several of them got built for museums and people bought some kits for me, but I stopped doing it after a while because Paramount uh, asked me to very nicely to cool it for a while. You know, we really appreciate what you're doing. We understand you're not selling a lot and it really only helps us what you're doing, but cool it for a while, then you can go back later and do it again. I have that letter somewhere. It blew my mind that they were so nice about it cool it but we're not mad at you so and it's always been that way so with my rep with my 
a relationship with them and, and me doing stuff. So uh, nothing but good experiences with Star Trek, no, no bad. And I want to mention that there to our listeners and people watching this today, uh, that Steve does, has a, uh, does have a YouTube channel, and he's chronicled the process of building the Enterprise, working on masks, many other models he's worked on and put lights on, all sorts of things, stuff that is uh, beyond my pay grade of understanding for models, because I'm a terrible model maker. Uh, but Steve, you do some amazing work, and your YouTube channel, it's very informative for folks who are interested in that. I, uh, I still have it. I don't contribute to it much anymore. I've since bought and paid for a Vimeo account. You can find me on Vimeo too, SNG Studio. Uh, Doug Drexler named the studio SNG because he used to call it Steve Neal's Garage. And uh, so we, we shifted to that SNG. And on there are all, there's a showcase that has all of the uh, building of this model that I did over 10 years ago. Uh, I think there's some on there as a chair too. I have more stuff to put on it uh, that, that I haven't done, but all my more recent work I do at this studio, which is a 2000 square foot two-story uh, studio, uh, and Mary and I do every day is all chronicled there uh, that, so you can see it because every week we do a show from inside the studio, kind of like test it a bit that Adam does uh, and uh, very nicely shot. We have, you know, professional camera, and professional equipment, good sound, and we do it all the way. And uh, the older videos are more handheld, you know, my own personal camera, I turn it on myself and this and that, but people seem to almost like those better for some reason. I don't know. Now that it's all professional and everything, they don't, you know, like it as much, but I had to, uh, I had to step it up. So. And for folks who today might be interested in checking out some of your work and possibly purchasing some of those masks for themselves, uh, how can they reach out to you? How can they contact you to find out more about how to do that? Uh, well, they can, they can go to uh, Steve Neal dot art dot blog and uh uh and you know that that's my uh art of steve neal website and on that art if you also if you don't remember that all you have to do is type in art of steve neal there's another steve neal he's a whole an artist in hawaii and does surfboards and stuff so don't get confused that one. but the art of steve neal uh chronicles all the artwork i've done in the past as well as present day uh, the work I've done with the author Whitley Strieber and, and shows related to UFO and paranormal stuff, but it also has a store of props and collector's masks that's in the menu. The menu's on the uh, right-hand side. You can scroll down and say collector's mask store. And I have a lot of stuff in there uh, besides Star Trek. Uh, uh, things from, well, like uh, I have the baby from, uh, I don't think I can do this. I get the baby from 2001, the Star Child, but I also have Moon Watcher. This is the same one that Adam Savage has. Uh, the, that the lips have. This is a replica of the real thing, and the lips actually move on it. The mouth moves, and everything as it did in the original uh, movie. And in fact, this particular one here actually has been worn by Dan Rector, who played Moon Watcher. He's also a friend. Don't ask me how I get to meet these people. They just come into my life out of nowhere, like Gary Lockwood. Um, and so. Uh, in fact, I had Dan and Gary both on our podcast together. That was a really wonderful time. And he asked to wear this. And I said, it's been over 50 years. You sure you want to do it? He said, yeah, let me, I want to put it on. So he put it on. I've got pictures I'll send you of him putting this on and the, my eyes popping out of the head, just like I did when I was on the set of Star Trek, the motion picture. That's what I mean. This stuff never gets old. For a lot of my friends that I've worked with all these years who were in the same field, uh, they've grown tired of it. They stopped doing it. Uh, they completely retired and they just i don't know what they do now they but they're not doing this stuff and i remember i remember when we all started in this stuff including rick baker he stayed to it we vowed we would never quit doing this stuff but we died doing it and so far myself and rick and and, and drexler there might be a few more but there's not many they've all retired they all kind of grew up they also decided to act their age. And that's that's a death sentence for a kid that, that loves space and Star Trek and toys and, and making monsters and all that stuff. It, 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 if it's really in your blood, it should never leave it. And it certainly hasn't for me. I can't stop doing it. And you know, I'm 68 now, my hands are starting to hurt me. You know, and, and I've been talking to a hand surgeon and I may have to have some surgery done so I can get another 10, 20 years out of this, because I plan to keep doing this stuff till I can. Um, 
other than that, I'm in really good health. You know, my weight's good and everything like that. So there's no reason to uh, believe that I can't continue doing this work. And so I'm doing it. I sculpt all my own stuff, mold all my stuff, because we can't have interns or help here anymore. So, uh, you know, it's put a lot of load on me, but I still love it. it it's fine. So I'm so fortunate. So, Steve, last question for you today. What is the best thing about being a part of the Star Trek universe? Oh, it's just a real honor and a privilege to have been part of Star Trek. It's something I will cherish all my life. I, and, you know, people will see my belt buckle. And this, the, the, the good one, which was an actual one from the show, finally crumbled apart because they weren't made for, for uh, everyday wear. Uh, this is, a, this is a cheap one I got on Amazon years ago. It's just one of my belt buckles, but I wear it quite often. And people always say to me, oh, I see you're a Trekkie. I said, well, they don't like that term, uh, but I do like Star Trek. But the real reason that I love Star Trek so much is because I worked on it. Oh, you know, so it's really nice to have that honor and to be able to say I was part of something so important. So incredibly important. Star Trek is so incredibly important for one reason. It has inspired so many great people, men and women, to reach for the stars. And that's the most important thing, in my opinion, we could do as a race, one race, the human race. I'm quoting uh, Edward almost, but it's true, uh, is to band together, go explore the stars. Because when we do that, and we get out in space and we look back at the earth getting smaller, we're gonna drop all our differences. We got we got bigger fish to fry, and it's out there waiting for us. And Star Trek and other shows, but really Star Trek is what's keeping that alive. Grabbing young people and saying, you know, I want to become an astronaut. I want Star Trek. And so we have a lot to be grateful for for Star Trek and to Gene Roddenberry. You know. I remember talking to Gene and, and really he, he was really fed up with war. I mean, he was a B-17 pilot. Matt Jeffries was his navigator who designed the Enterprise. And you can imagine going through World War II and flying B-17s and dropping tonnage of bombs on people and killing people. And uh, it was a terrible thing. And he envisioned a future where we would finally get away from that drop all our differences, drop the racism, uh, and become one race united together to explore the stars. So I know I, I'm, I'm beating a dead horse here, but it, that, that's what Star Trek is for me. Thank you, Star Trek. Thank you, Gene. All right, that's, that was a great answer, Steve. And uh, you know, thank you again so much for your time today. And for folks out there who are curious again about buying any of the pieces we talked about today or seeing any more of his artwork or learning more about his process, uh, we're going to have links to everything that Steve mentioned and a lot more in the show notes. So make sure you guys take a look at that. Uh, so Steve, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your stories. And thank you for your contributions to Star Trek and film in general, really, you know, especially Ghostbusters. I'm a Ghostbusters guy as much as I'm a Star <laughs> Trek guy. So big shout out about that too. So yeah, again, Thanks. Steve, it's been great. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It was an honor. And that was our chat with Steve Neal, who had some great stories, and I urge all of you to seek him out if you ever find him at a convention. We spoke a bit about Fred Phillips today, and this isn't the first time his name has come up, and it certainly will not be the last. Trek fans know him best for his work in Star Trek, specifically for creating Spock's ears like we discussed. Initially, Fred was contracted by the studio to figure out the look of Leonard Nimoy's character and work on getting those ears just right. The problem was, every time he gave the studio something to approve, they rejected it. It was ultimately Charlie Schramm, who was the head makeup artist at MGM, who designed the first set of ears that were approved and then used in the Star Trek pilot, The Cage. And once those ears were locked in and finalized, it was then Fred's job to cast them each week whenever they shot the episodes so that Leonard Nimoy had a fresh pair to wear. Those latex ears were produced typically a few times during the week, as they weren't necessarily the most durable bits around, and it started a tradition in Star Trek that would continue on for decades. But Star Trek was part of the tail end of Fred's career, and while he did work on the very first motion picture, he was unable to return for the Wrath of Khan due to his diminishing eyesight. Some of his other contributions in makeup included The Wizard of Oz, House of Usher, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, The Outer Limits, and many, many more TV shows and films. And as it turns out, Fred was also a pretty big sci-fi nerd in real life. So much like many of the folks we talked to on this show, he too was living the dream. So whenever you think of Romulans, Klingons, Vulcans, or any of the other aliens that appeared in the Star Trek original series, 
Just think of Fred Phillips and the contributions that he made to Star Trek history. He was a true pioneer in special effects and makeup, and someone whose work has continued to bring joy to generations years after he's passed away. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Trek Untold. If you aren't already, please make sure you're following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Trek Untold. And if you'd like to watch the video version of this podcast when available, make sure to check out youtube.com slash nerdnews today. And don't forget, you can also check out teespring.com slash stores slash Trek Untold. Check out all the Trek Untold merchandise we have, or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash Trek Untold. Any contribution you can make helps keep this ship running at optimum power. But even just listening to the show and telling your friends about it does a pretty big thing for us too. So please leave a rating and review if you're listening to this in the audio form, or give the video on YouTube a thumbs up and sub to the channel. There's no wrong way to help Trek Untold out, so whether you're just dropping a review, giving us ratings, or if you're able to offer us any support monetarily, we thank you so much for doing that, and we also thank you for again choosing to listen to Trek Untold. Once again, thank you to our sponsor, Triple Fiction Productions. And shout out to Scott Ray for helping provide this week's guest. If you'd like to book this person to appear at an upcoming convention or autograph signing event, email scottray67 at aol.com. If you'd like to send us some feedback, suggest a guest, or ask to be booked as a guest on this show, or provide a sponsorship opportunity at Trek Untold, please email me at trekuntold at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you and hear your thoughts on what you thought about this week's episode and our guest. I'm Matthew Kaplowitz, this has been Trek Untold, and until next time, fortune favors the bold.